So today's guest on the Keenan Yoga podcast is Cranti. Now, Cranti is known as Cranti in the yoga world or Renato to friends and family back in Italy. Native Italian, he has taught in Tokyo, Japan for I think about 16 years at Under the Light Studio. I met him in Mysore a number of years ago. Thoroughly nice guy. Really enjoyed time with him. So it's really a pleasure to have. I haven't seen you for about 10 years, I think. So to see you again yes. now. Hi, yeah. Hi, Adam. yeah. Yeah, it's thanks really. For having uh, me. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I should have got to you sooner. Um, you know, I always <laughs> uh, remembered cooking those Italian meals back in Mysore, um, and uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> the fun we used to have. <laughs> um, so I, mean, I know you've got a long story with yoga and with India. Um, would you mind just uh, introducing yourself a little bit to the listenership? And so you were just told me how you went to India first of all in 1990, in which I remarked, "How old are you then?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yes my first trip in india not in my uh, in india mm. it was in 1991 actually and um i went there out of curiosity to, you know to explore a place that i've been hearing a lot from people that i knew that were older than me and i've been traveling there before so yeah, I was very, very curious. As I've been all my life, pretty much, uh, it's my my nature to it's just curiosity all the time. I just want to see it, just want to know. And honestly, my English was really bad at that time. You know, through hardly saying anything. I went, I just took backpack, you know, I, and and I left. I left Italy and I took the airplane and I arrived there. And, and there you go. I was in India, you know, not speaking anything pretty much with, you know, with a dictionary and stuff. And, um, yeah, I wanted to go there, uh, for, for different reasons. Uh, one, of course, uh, was the, the curiosity to see the country that I've been hearing a lot about. It. Uh, and the second thing is that I wanted to, to go to the Osho commune, uh, Rajneesh uh, Bhagwan. Mm, and mm. um and so i you know i spent six months in india and, and i spent about a month and a half too uh in pune uh the commune uh unfortunately osho left the body one year before so but still there was a lot of fire there was like you know it was still the energy was really really high uh, there you know amazing place for me i, I know you know the controversial you know thoughts about it and stuff but uh, my experience has been only positive really and, mm. and that was in Bangalore. And, you know, no the ashram is a pune sorry pune pune, pune. Yeah, pune. Yeah, yeah. yes yeah. yes in pune and, and that's um, where you got the name yes that's where i got the name yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, a few years later a few years later though uh, i think a second third trip i went there because i was just keep going Mm. Uh, it, w it was very exciting for me also because you know um i you know i, I when i start to be interested in in, in, in body mind let's say you know and mm. spiritual things and i was really really young actually i started to read my first book on meditation when i was 14 uh, again out of curiosity because a friend of mine was reading something about meditation i was like oh that's interesting so i, I went to you know a bookstore there was no google there was nothing at that time and um and i just you know i just choose a couple of books you know and i start to read and uh, mm. and, and it was really interesting because you know i thought that always uh, how interesting that people we are so different you know and um i wanted to understand more about how i am and how other people are um, and so you know i started to read different things psychology meditation and um and finally, when I came across um, Osho, and then you know, I was like, okay, okay, I'm in India, I'm going to go there and see what happened. As I recall, you were doing yoga before you went to Mysore and studied Ashtanga yoga as well, right? You were already trained oh, yes, and, yes, and practicing yes, yoga yes. for a long time. So how did it start the yoga then? How does that tie into the whole thing? Well, the thing is, uh, a couple of friends of mine, they were, as I said, they were older than me and they were to India. And so... Sometimes we just met up, you know, in the park and things. They were doing some, you know, some very stiff looking Surya Namaskar, you know, and I was just like, I just try different things. And then, you know, uh, a few years later, I, I met a friend that she was uh, an Iyengar teacher uh, teaching at the gym. And she was like, come, 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 come to join my class. And so I started to go there, you know, and take some Iyengar classes. Um, 
And uh, that's how I was slowly, slowly stuck with Asana. But as I said before, I was already doing meditation uh, mm. when, when I really start to go in, into this, those, you know, Asana focused mm. classes. And, um, and so for me, you know, the Asana has been always an important part, of course. Um, but I, I never put it just in front of the meditation part. I don't know. I have been always thinking that for me, you know, uh, as I was, was an, a nice practice to, you know, to focus on my body, to focus on my energy and so on. But, you know, regarding especially the mind, I, I always thought like meditation was a thing for me. Uh, mm. you know, Did you always think it worked? Up? But- from the start yes, have you kept yes, that up throughout yes, have yes, you right. yes yes, what, yes, what, yes i didn't yeah. know that what style of meditation do you practice well i did start uh, uh, in the beginning with just like you know uh uh in just mindfulness you know what i mean uh, mm. this just feeling the breath and sitting and and quite and then over the years you know when i was in uh, for example in puna uh there were different groups i don't know how if you know how it works, there are, there are workshops, there are training and stuff, mm, and, mm. and they are teaching, you know, different kind of meditation, you know, Zazen, for example. Um, so, you know, I, I've been trying different things, and then at one point, I, I figured out my own way, you know, I mean, just like sitting and, and, and uh, you know, and being there, you know. So you start always, of course, with, you know, some some different kind of meditation where it involves also the body movement. Like for example, in, in the Osho community, we do this dynamic meditation. I don't know if you're familiar Yeah, with I have heard that that one. Yeah, the kind of emotional <laughs> release or you know, everyone's heard very, that one. Yeah, very yeah, 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 intense, yeah. Very intense, very intense. And, um, so you did that one as well? And, oh yeah, we're doing this every morning, one hour of screaming, shouting, dancing, uh, uh wow. freezing and, and and feeling you know like uh and i was really intense man intense and yeah. we were doing yeah. it outside we were still outside and then after a few years they they put uh, the meditation room inside because neighbors and things but it was outside where you know also used to give a speech and um Pretty intense, pretty intense. Yeah. <laughs> it was like breathing nose 10 minutes, you know, and like like screaming and shouting everything you have outside for another 10 mm, minutes, mm, mm. you know, then jump in and, and who, 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 like, you know, this <laughs> crazy mantra and then freeze for 15 minutes and then dance. The last part was dancing, you know, this free dancing like that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> huh. Every morning, yeah. That's also yeah, very that's, early. That, I think that's was... kind of interesting for everyone to hear, actually, because many people... Yeah. I mean, do you see that documentary, Wild Country, I suppose? You've seen that, haven't yes, you? Yes, 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 but, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. So it's good to have a bit of an insight from that, because I think that portrays a certain... Uh, the community in a certain light, you know, maybe not so positive, but, but you you know, yeah, it's nice to have, I, I know. to have a different... I mean, I can't, um, I can't say much, you know, about what happened when Osho was alive or in the 70s, mm, mm. you know, when I was not there. Uh, but while I was there, all the years I've been going there, uh, honestly, I mean, my experience has been amazing. And I met so many people because, you know, most of the uh, Osho therapists are actually psychotherapists, psychologists, you know, like neuroscientists. Like, there are people who are prepared, you know, just like, you know, uh, people just randomly jumping around. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have been, you know, working with, you know, with, with the Western therapy and, and the meditation from the East side, you know, combining uh, for you know, trauma release, for all, all kinds of things, really, really. Mm. Family constellation. A lot of lot of interesting things, really. We were doing also like like three four days silence, for example, just closing some kind of chambers, you know, most of the day, and and just in silence, you know, not speaking at all. And so there were different kind of meditation, also, you know, uh, that they were doing, and then I found all of them really interesting. So, you know, yeah, I wanted to yeah, see, yeah, yeah. I wanted to see like what's happened to me if I do this for three days, or if I. If I don't speak for three days, man, it's like the energy is like, yeah, you want to say something, but you can't, you know, and, and so you watch, you know, how you feel about it, you know, and, and, and interesting, you discover a lot of things about yourself. Very, very interesting. Where did you find the need to do the Ashtanga then? How did, how did you find yourself in Mysore doing Ashtanga yoga with that background? Oh, how well, that you about? know, I, yeah, um, 
in you know i was i was uh in berlin uh, uh, late 90 in the beginning of 2000 and um i was just you know i was already doing a little bit you know vinyasa yoga at the time and so on so i started to practice a little bit more of a different style yengar shivananda for example uh i was a few times also in london at shivananda center uh, a few years back and um and so I went to the studio and then there was this, uh, this guy, Peter Graves, uh, which is like, you know, one of the, one of the most old actually students, uh, you know, let's say around you know, people like, uh, John Scott, maybe was there, Alino Miele, that, around that, that time, you know, and Peter Graves, a German guy, was there. Yeah, was I've also heard of him. And, that, and when yes. it, what was he? So he was in Milan, was he? No, no, no. I was in Berlin, in Berlin, Germany. Oh, you were in Berlin by that time. Okay. Yes, yeah. Okay. By that time, right. I was in Berlin already. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. Um, so, so I I started to do you know a couple of classes with him, and the first, I mean, the first class was like I think was half primary or something. Oh my god, I was like that's blow my mind completely, you know, because it was something very different than what you know, all the as in a class I've done before. And, uh, and I was like, whoa, and I remember just like walking back home that evening and like sh completely shaking. My body was shaking, you know, from, from the practice. And I was like, mm. and, I, and I was thinking I couldn't sleep at night because it was that evening class, you know, so all this energy and stuff. And then I was like, you know what? I just want to go back tomorrow again, you know, <laughs> I was like, just caught me like this. It was like, it was so hard. I could almost do anything, you know, because. Yeah, I used to practice a different style of yoga. You know, I was doing, I did also teacher training uh, a little bit before in Italy with a, with a very famous uh, Italian teacher, not a shanga. And, uh, mm. but you know, it was like more quiet, more, you know, one other, just rest a little mm. bit, you know, some pranayama, some meditation at the end, but nothing so dynamic, you know, so like a shanga. And I think maybe that was also. You know what caught my my personality you know um, i'm very intense very active person uh since i was kids so um yeah that was that was my my beginning and then from there i was just like tried to go as much as possible to workshop you know whenever there was a workshop in europe you know um and uh that's how how i start in fact when you know when i when i went to to, to Meisel the first time, 2005, I already been going through like teacher training with Richard Freeman in Boulder. I went two months in LA with uh, uh, Mati Ezrati and Lisa Walford, uh, mm. you know, my poor Mati. Um, and um, so I've been already practicing a lot. I was going to Meisel class every morning, actually every afternoon with, with Mati in uh, Yoga Works. Uh, she was having a, an afternoon miser class and, and Chuck was teaching in the morning. I went also to some Chuck class as well. Mm. Um, I'm actually a very good friend with Chuck and, and Matty. And, um, and then, you know, uh, yeah, I took the teacher training with Richard Freeman in 2003. Um, so I was just like, you know, going and trying to get as much as I could, you know, from different teachers, but, um, before, before I went to Mysore. Mm. Mm. So when when I arrived when I arrived in Mysore, you know, I knew I was going to do the primary series, of course, as everybody doing. But at the time, I was already doing Hanumanasa, I think, you know, like in my practice, and I went to all the way back and start from zero, basically, <laughs> which was fun. I think everyone has that experience. I, I mean, I kind of, I vague, I vaguely remember seeing you then. I didn't know you. I remember you having long dreadlocks at the time, and. <laughs> I, and I could, I could also remember you were very interested in the handstands at the Southern Star as well. I used to see you doing some handstands, I think, you know, and thinking, yeah, this guy is really into it, you know, and, uh, and yeah. And then I think I, you know, saw you in the, in the Maestro room and it's like, you, everyone's held back there and, you know, like you're not doing all the stuff, you know, like, yeah, it's a, you know, it is a, a humbling experience being there. Um, yeah, and I yeah. suppose you know. I mean, and and you know, from you said two thousand and five, and we met in about I think you know two thousand and fourteen or something. And you've gone. You you mentioned to me almost every year. I think since then, um, and up until recently, uh, you know, it's an obvious question. But you know, how has how have you felt that things have 
have changed for you and let's say just start with have changed for you in your in your experience of Mysore mm. over the years but you know 2005 of course Guruji was was still alive you know and uh, but Sharath was mostly teaching you know <laughs> or at least was the person that you you could mm -hmm. relate more you know for language matter as well you know uh, and um well there was there was a big shift of course you, you could feel you know and there was like Sharath was having also his class after that you know in in, in the building in front of the shala there some people were going there some people are here uh, then there was of course the people were being practiced with with with, with Guruji for, for, you know, several years before. And, um, I don't know, there was this, this group of new students coming, you know, and getting excited about Sharat and everything. And, and all the students that they were like, okay, but this is, you know, Guruji is my teacher. So um, for me, it was like, they were both. I mean, I arrived there really open and fresh. Like I normally, going into things as i say you know i'm curious you know i'm just gonna go there and see what happened you know with my ex because because you know years back I, I could have gone to miser before you know i went to Auroville to practice i want to practice with mm. karen actually but also karen was exactly that year when i went there she decided to stop teaching ashtanga yoga because you know all the reason for mm, it mm, mm. you know and i spoke with her you know i went there because i want to practice with her and then I had a meeting with her. And, you know, she, I mean, she was telling me things, you know, that, you know, the reason why basically she, she stopped and she would not go to Miser anymore, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so I was already in Autoville. And then I was like, oh, there was Gerard. I don't know if you know from uh, Ashtanga Paris. Yeah, we had, he's been on the podcast. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, he was teaching. He was teaching there. So I took one month there with him. Um, and so I could have gone to Miser actually, but I didn't go because honestly speaking, uh, there was a lot of rumors, you know, around, you know, the word, you know, the mm. yoga words where people will tell me, don't go there, they're going to break your body and so on. And of course, in the beginning, I was like, I was like, oh, really? You know, I was like, but, but as I said before, it's like, I'm, I'm not so happy just to believe what people tell me. If I can, I want to experience myself. And so, you know, and there, at one point, there was a time where I was like, you know what? This is a good time for me to go and, and see because I'm not scared, you know, you know, mm. you know, of, of really uh, going and experience things, you know, by myself. And uh, I like to hear people. I like to hear opinion and stuff. And the opinion were all different anyway. You know, some people are very Absolutely, positive yeah, opinion. Yeah, 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 yeah. Others yeah. are like, no, yeah. they're going to break your body. Blah, blah. Totally. Like, I know, had exactly gonna, the same I'm gonna experience. See, yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah, see yeah. and, you know. I'm yeah, experience yeah. and everything, and uh, it was 2005. So when and it was, yeah, and it was an interesting birthday. time. You put your your finger on it. It was an interesting kind of time when when yeah. Guruji was on the way out. Obviously, he was still there, but not really that present, you know. And then yeah, Shirat yes, was really yes. taking over, but Shirat really wasn't confident in taking over because obviously his veneration for his grandfather was very strong, so he was always standing yes. back. Um, yes, and then you had this yes, kind of yeah. new, the new and the old students kind of battling it out. Would they stay? Would they take Sharat as the teacher? It was a very interesting time, wasn't well, it? Well, there were some situations also where, you know, Guruji would say to do something to one student, and then Sharat would say no, and they were having a little, you know, in the shop, in their language. You know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And the students were a little bit confused what to do, you know. Uh, but it was interesting. I mean, oh, every, whenever the, this kind of changes, like, you know, generational changes, I don't know how you want to call it, you know, like mm. uh, the teach, teachers retiring and, and the new is coming. Of course, there are some different opinions, some, you know, some situation, you know, where, to, you know, can be very interesting to see from outside, but, but they're all in the normal, I think, you know. I just remember Sabi Joyce always wanted to shut the window and Sharat always wants to open the windows. There's a battle in that. And I was kind of definitely in the Sharat camp. I can, you could do, you could always do with more air in that room. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 
obviously you made your way through and you know when i saw you doing you know i think most of the advanced series um so you know you'd made a good amount of progression but i also know that you'd you know you'd had difficulties with a back injury for a number of years and i think it's important yeah. for people to know that you know even advanced teachers and long-term practitioners can also have difficulties and and, and struggles you, would you mind sharing a little bit how you worked with that and how you yeah. overcome it or how your practices developed around mm -hmm. that anything yeah, you yeah. could say would be much appreciated yeah i mean you know there's been a time where um, I, I got injury or I started to feel, you know, uh, pain in my back. And, mm. um, and I was not sure exactly, you know, what happened. So um, I, I went to check, you know, and, uh, and there was some herniated disc, basically. Um, it's also true that my, my spine was a little bit out of alignment somehow, you know. Uh, like the top of my sacrum was a little bit more forward uh, compared with the, with the upper uh, vertebra. So, um, I mean, I don't know if that's due to an accident I had or I was just born like this, I'm not sure. So, but, you know, over the years, you know, I tried to, you know, catching and catching and catching. Uh, and so, bending backwards, uh, obviously, maybe this has been degenerating the situation, you know. And, um, and so at one point, I, you know, I, I, I discovered that I was into this. And, uh, of course, it was very scary in the beginning. And, uh, because it was my first, probably main injury. You know, I haven't had any big, big stuff going on, you know, no operation, nothing, you know, with my body, never broke any bones and stuff. So I was like, wow. Oh, okay. Now we have to see what to do about it. You know, it's like, mm. how am I going to, I'm going to manage the situation because, you know, um, when you have certain things like that, I mean, yes, your teacher can suggest something, you know, uh, somebody, your friends can suggest them, but at the end of the day, you, you have to take a responsibility. You have to search, do things, you know, start to, you know, practice a little bit differently, modification. Uh, things like that, you know, strengthening, for example, and try to work. just, you have to work a little bit different, you know, uh, in order not to aggravate the situation. And, uh, you know, now I'm like, I discovered this maybe 13, 14 years ago, and um, I still have it. I just got an MRI, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, right. it's still there. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and ha this has limited my range of motion uh, to some extent. Uh, and that's also, I think, due to, you know, the fact that maybe the mind doesn't want to, doesn't, the nervous system, I would say, doesn't allow you to go even further just to prevent something happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So, um, so I'm dealing with it. You know, I'm dealing, I'm doing my practice and the practice also you know, change over the years and depends on the situation, the time and so on. So I wasn't sure because I see some I see some pretty nifty moves on Facebook sometimes from you. So I wasn't sure how you were getting yeah, on. I mean, look, it looks like you're still know. still holding the it's... torch uh, quite strongly for Ashtanga. But what, what would you say? Yeah. I mean, in terms of um, how you've dealt, do you take the postures out that aggravate? I mean, would you do that with a student? I mean, you've always been traditional, and after all, you're Italian anyway, so you like things yeah. traditional. Um, you know, but how would you, uh, and how do you see the practice? I mean, it's a question I ask many people in Ashtanga, you know, obviously the method mm -hmm. is there, but at certain points, the sequence isn't possible necessarily without pain. I mean, do you take the posture out? Do you modify it? Do you work around? Do you do something completely yes, different? Yeah. 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 And how do you relate uh, to that? Yeah. I mean, uh, talking personally in, in my situation, yeah. of course, uh, I've been going, uh, around by exploring things, you know, how I thought to do certain things. Um, I might have kept sometimes some, some deep, deep posture, uh, for a while. And, um, I'm still practicing, but maybe I don't go as deep also because I don't, I honestly don't see the necessity of it. You know, like, I mean, if I, if I touch my toes, if I catch my ankles, you know, in the end of the day, uh, it doesn't change much uh, uh, to what exactly. gives me, yes. you know, yeah. And, and yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as a person, exactly. as a human being, mm. as, a, mm. as a, you know, so it, it doesn't really change to me. And um, of course, this will also go on, you know, 
with uh, with with my students, you know, when when somebody is going through some kind of injury or, or, or problem, you know, we try to always work out something around the practice because, um, you know, I think mm, this is very, I think, common sense. You know, <laughs> the practice should be supporting your life, not you supporting the practice. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, I think that's. That at least for me, that's how I see things. You know, I, I want to get you know whenever whatever age I'm gonna get in, in a good condition. You know, I want to be healthy, be able to walk nicely, to sit, to ride my motorbike, to do you know to live a, a normal life. I don't want to you know go around with my back pain <laughs> and you know <laughs> or something. I think <laughs> I think it's your fast motorbikes that are more likely to uh, cause the the shortening of your life, not the Ashtanga Yoga. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to ride a very fast motorbike, guys. Um, you know, <laughs> at a certain point, don't you think, like, is it, what What keeps you coming back to Ashtanga rather than just kind of thinking, okay, I'm old enough now, wise enough to make my own thing up, you know? Like, I've got a certain injury I'm working with. Why don't you just make something? I mean, you know, your personal opinion again. Why don't Why don't you just make your own thing up? You've got all the experience now. What keeps you back to the Ashtanga as a method? You mean, you, know, you, mean, those you mean, yeah, to keeping the sequences, to keeping the vinyasa idea. Yeah, I mean, we call it, I suppose, sequences in Ashtanga, really, as it is what defines yeah. you doing Ashtanga or not something else, you know, yes, and it's dynamism. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, uh, I, I see that, you know, the practice as, as a framework, like, you know, they, you know, you, you take it, there's the vinyasa, but, you know, sometimes maybe you, you don't do it differently, you know, there are, you know, there's a sequence, but sometimes you maybe going to go and modify it a little bit, you know, and, uh, uh, some days, you know, I might, I might spend, uh, more breath in, in the posture. I do less posture, but I stay longer. Um, some other times I, you know, I might introduce some different movement, in, you know, in, in the practice. And, uh, you know, the thing is that, uh, to be honest with you, except the, the time when I, when I'm in my story, uh, the rest of the, the time and most of my life, I've been practicing a lot. Mm -hmm. which i love it which i love it to be honest with you for me the practice alone is like is when you face all your goals and all your you know it's like your laziness and so on because you know when you go into the shower and there are like under people around you you charge you go through you know it's like when you wake up in the morning and you roll your mat every single day and there's no one around there that excite you know takes you up there's mm. no one looking at you or help you or wherever mm, mm -hmm. you know and, uh, it's a different story and when you do this for 15 20 years you know it, it's totally different so you know mm. when you are when you are by yourself uh you also listen more you know and, and you explore things in a, such a different way you know and and you know, it's not, I'm not here to say like, oh, I'm doing this movement or that movement or, you know, that. I think it does, you know, it always changed. Um, so I keep the frame, you know, like the primary series, intermediate, advanced A, and the libido B that what I normally practice in Mysore, you know, and, and, and I do for some time, but sometimes I, I shorten, sometimes I put something in between. Um, so, it's it's just a frame more, you know, for me. Um, yeah, and, and touch on something you know, really important you... there. Yeah, which is um, how do you keep motivating yourself outside having? And people often ask me like, so who do you go to as a teacher? And he's going to say, well, you know, I was going to Mysore, and now you know, I kind of practice on my own. You know, it's like, and that's just you know that's what was always traditionally done right it's only more recently that people have access to teachers in every town or city where they live um and you sure. know it was always you go go to mysore for a couple few months and then you come home and the rest of the year you're practicing on your own or but nevertheless i mean the question is pertinent for many people like what you know what when you don't feel like it how do you keep up your motivation when you're in pain or when you you know you feel lazy mm -hmm. you know, what you know have you got any advice for anyone to you know in terms of how or at least you know just share with us how you motivate yourself when you really don't yeah, want to uh i i think it, the motivation comes to the fact that you know the when you practice you feel good <laughs> you know when you finish to practice you feel like okay you know i feel 
different. You know, I feel something that I I want, I need for for my daily life. Uh, mm. But again, it does it doesn't have to be too awkward. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's like you know, there are days and days. Uh, the the different the the main difference you know, in teaching and practicing in between when you are in Mysore or when you are you know back home, it's pretty substantial. I mean. You know, when you are in Mysore, you do nothing all day, pretty much. You just practice, and then you decide, you know, if you want to go to the pool, or you want to take some, you know, chanting course, or sleep and watch Netflix, like, you know, or, or whatever. You decide, right? But you have mm. a choice. But when you're back home, after you've been teaching or practicing, you have all the rest, you know, you have your family or children, work, other stuff you have to do you know you mm. don't have, i don't have a ma- i don't have a maid that comes and clean my house and you know and wash my clothes you know what i mean like a miser uh i don't you know so i cook i do things so, so i have you know we have life and so that's why what i'm saying is like when when you practice back home or when you teach to people they have life and they're busy extremely busy like people are for example here in tokyo um you have to adapt i don't know how to say if that's the correct mm, word yeah, you know adapt yeah. adapt the practice to the situation from your injury to the person who is really busy uh to your you know to yourself you know you're traveling you do different things you know i used to be so uh straight with myself really it's like you know there was like i wouldn't miss one day of practice and if i did for whatever reason traveling or something I felt almost, almost guilty, you know, uh, and over the years, of course, or, you know, guilty or even the fear of like losing the flexibility. Oh my Lord. You know, it's like, you know, was, but, you know, luckily, you know, uh, I, that was just for, for a short time it was just really in the beginning, the first few years where I, you know, and then I soon realized, you know, uh, my reality what it is you know what what's good for me because you know uh, i think we are especially after a few years that we uh we get to know uh, ourselves you know we know what's true yeah we know what works we know what's resonate you know what i mean that's part of the journey and i think everyone kind of goes through that but i think if you're going to keep it up for the long term you have to start becoming realistic with yourself and yeah, not beating yourself up for those kind of things. and uh, But, uh, you know, it's a very relevant thing you, you bring up, and I'm pleased you do because, uh, I, you know, many people do suffer with this guilt and they have to do it exactly as, as they have been shown by their teacher every day or exactly as they've done in Mysore every day, the same thing. And you know, they can't miss a day. And if they're in pain, they still have to do the same pro- practice, you know. Um, and it's a shame because I think there's a beautiful method inside inside this. But, mm. but that kind of uh, approach to the method can, uh, you know, can turn it into a bit of a... Uh, a sufferance for people where you know it really doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be um course, so you know you've been teaching in tokyo for many years and we had a little conversations back and forth before this and and you mentioned that you know you find uh and, and i found as well teaching in asia these last few years and you know perhaps a difference mentality in the western students and i mean i'm assuming you teach mainly japanese people there um you know, uh, how is the relationship different? Would you say between uh, your students there and what you your students you've had in the West when you travel? And you know, I know you taught West Western uh, students and workshops and mm-hmm. stuff as well. Yeah, so, yes. you don't say anything on that. Well, and, and the other thing is uh, another question before I just get this in before you start. Um, do you yeah. find that there's any challenges different in in say uh, the Japanese body or the Asian body? And I mean, you know, generalizations, people, you know. But uh, is there any differences or challenges to uh, to a, a Caucasian, you know, a Western, say, let's yes, say, European yes, or yes. American, Australian body? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I will start with the second words. Then uh, the second question, uh, totally, totally different. I mean, in general, obviously, you know, uh, I mean. I have been teaching here for 16 years in my class, mm. pretty much five days a week. And I've been, as you say, occasionally teaching in Europe. And, um, and yeah, so I, I can totally see that. First of all, I mean, people here are just like in size, smaller, uh, in general, uh, more kind of flexible, I would say, mm. uh, just naturally you know um bigger yeah. you know small smaller bones you know like somehow really just everything is it's in in scales smaller somehow 
And um, I, I totally find them much more free, especially when, you know, when they have to sit on the floor, you know, and, and so the hips, you know, and so on. Are, I'm more used to, you know, to sit on their knees, for example, where, you know, in the West we are not. And, mm. um, and I, I have to say that, you know, um, yeah, I, I noticed the, the, the difference is substantial, really. Um, so you can also imagine you know, when you, when you have a practice that is quite dynamic, where you have to carry the, your body weight up and down, jumping back and forth. If you have a smaller body, it's it's a little bit easier, you know, that if you are, you know, one meter eighty or maybe ninety kilo uh, <laughs> with bones, like, you know, bones like this and, and muscle like that, you know. Yeah. So you know, uh, when when you start to do like already. Ardabada Padmotanasa, you can see that it's amazing. I mean, here, 90, I don't know, I think 90% of the students, whenever they come to club, they can do. But, you know, I've been teaching in the West and it's yeah, totally yeah. different. Totally different. Real, real, totally it, different. It is. It is. In general. Yeah. In general. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, obviously we're painting with broad strokes here, folks. Um, but it is different. I think we can say that. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that, you know, it is the, the practice, this particular modality. I'm not sure if, you know, swinging a, a sledgehammer or lifting a heavy, you know, like a weightlifting, you might be better off as a as a Bulgarian, you know, so mm. if you're going to, you know, they, they <laughs> yes. have, but well, the, the Kel is apparently the Celtic hip that, that allows the, the, particularly Bulgarians and Eastern Europeans to lift um, to the, the heavy weights, you know, the kind of um, off the floor mm. over the head, mm. you know, so I mean, every, you know, different races have different propensities and you got to say that when you see um you know in the indian south asians practicing you kind of understand okay that this practice does make sense whereas you know i was teaching in london for many years to you know white english guys you know a lot of them bankers you know i was in the city of london you kind of think well there's so, so many changes you have to start making that you kind of wonder you know start oh, to yes, well yes, you know yes. is this really the best thing that they could be doing you know um i don't know i mean i think it's you know it's useful to know because i mean it's a great practice anyway and they enjoyed it anyway and our limitations in the west are often greater and we have to work around things more you know that it might mm. not be the first you know, if what, someone's designing a Western form of yoga, looking at a European body, they might not design some of the series as it was done, you know, as it's done in Mysore, right? You probably wouldn't make uh, Lotus posture one of your first postures, right? Um, <laughs> you know, you'd probably do something else like, you know, like maybe cross legs, you know, even cross leg for many people. And, you know, they have never practiced yoga. They're older guys, for example, you know, even sitting on the floor in cross leg position is painful. So, you know. I think, you know, it's good for people to recognize this because there's this assumption that, the, you know, that everyone should be able to do it because it's the primary series. Whereas actually these postures are pretty advanced, you know. Um, Oof, is there any yes. things that, you know, on the other foot, is there any things that they struggle with, would you say? Would you say that you notice that people struggle with anything particular there that you uh, might not find? Well, in, in general, a little bit strength, uh, I would say, strength. Right. Um, because, again, you know, I see flexibility. I mean, if people here, they come the first time, they do, do couple thousand, they go back and they catch the ankles, they come up and they look at you like, if nothing has happened, it's the first time, you know, and then you see some other people <laughs> with their eyes open like that when they come up, you know, so uh, there's a lot of, I mean, in general, more flexible, but sometimes really lack of strength. And then you can see when they start to do maybe stuff like inversions or whatever. You know, it's like, they're just wobbling. Uh, but again, that's that's also in general you know, and there are stiff people here there are strong people here very strong you know um and and again i in general i think like shorter more compact body it's it's a little bit easier to control you know when you have long so limbs I, and long it is, you know, it is. Like, look at, i mean apart from richard freeman or chuck who uh, richard freeman and chuck miller they're both of a reasonable size of height but many of the ashtanga teachers you kind of meet them for the first time and you think oh wow you're really really quite short and i'm you know and i'm no one to speak i'm five foot nine you know i'm not I mean, you're about the same right you may be a bit taller than me but no similar height i think um you know and then you meet someone like john scott or lino and you think wow you know um yeah, I don't know what size they are, but you know, it, it is a, it's very helpful to be shorter. You know, you know. Um, oh, see, yeah, and especially when you see yeah. all these uh, float floating people, you know, floating into handstand. All those, you, you you see their their, their body proportion, body you know, and yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. it makes a lot of sense. You probably like long legs, short upper body. I mean, you know, 
and things are different, you know. So proportions are very important in order to, you know, to prefer, perform in certain way that looks yeah in a certain way you know for sure the thing is also sure. to, to recognize that that the, you know i mean i'm always trying to kind of shed the light on this fact that you know the the practice is not necessarily going to turn out the same for everyone it's like you know i think there's this <laughs> sense of the, the, kind of the, um, the modern world that they, oh you just have to work hard enough and everyone could do everything but that's not the case you know and different people have different mm-hmm. genetics and proportions and you know things will turn out differently for different people uh, regardless of how hard they work some people will never do certain things you know and right. uh yeah. you know a, a dose of but, realism you know, is helpful as well um what about the teaching also... relationship uh same. There's this substantial differences because um, I mean I can talk mostly about Japan because I live here and uh, mm. there's very very high respect towards anybody who is teacher or sensei. You know, mm. um, so when even when you introduce yourself to people and say I'm yoga yoga sensei and they're like, oh, you call you sensei, oh, do you? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they call you, you know, if they say I'm yoga teacher. Oh, yoga and sensei, oh. Um, and, you know, that that's pretty much, I mean, it's very respected. And um, and and students look at you like like your teacher, you know. They respect you. They listen to you. They also, they hardly argue, like, you know, challenge you. Like yeah, in the yeah, West. Yeah. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Are you sure? Are you sure? I'm so like, and so told me what? that. Yeah, you're, you know, yeah, yeah. I would do it this yeah, way. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. You know, probably yeah. So, and I, I'm not saying uh, I, I like the challenge. I like when people have questions, actually, which is here. Yeah, it doesn't happen very much because, again, it's a culture thing. Mm. Normally, they don't quest. They don't question the teacher. You know, and just they might don't agree with you, but they will also not just like uh, start to argue with you about something. You know. Uh, very different than the West, for example. When they don't agree with you, they're just going to start an argument. It's clear, probably, right? I mean, yeah. along those lines, well, do you it's... find it harder? Yeah, I mean, do you find it harder to read them then? I mean, you, you do you feel that sometimes they wouldn't be honest with you if they're in pain or if they don't find something Ma... appropriate or comfortable? Or do you still feel that you're able to, d- to relate directly? Uh, after several years, is you can more clear right, so it now. takes a little bit longer. It takes it, to yeah, understand. because in the beginning, yeah. I, came, I came with you know, with the idea of talking to people directly and ask direct question. Where right. here it doesn't work like that, and right. nothing is working like that. Nothing is like direct answer and question, it's always like how you frame the, the, the question, you know, and it's like you, you never go direct to the point, you just try, you just go a little bit around with a softness and and you know. It's very different, and you know. So, but in general, people uh, regarding pain or whatever, it, for that matter, you know, they they are pretty honest. But sometimes, again, maybe they don't tell you things. But so it's up to your experience when you start to see they are doing certain things in a certain way, uh, or they, you know, or looking the expression of the face, or something like. Then eventually, you know, uh, I will go mm. there and just try to to figure out what what's going on. But um. They're pretty honest. They're actually, you know, very honest people. They just like, you know, they just listen and, and try to, you know, do what, what you, you know, ask. And, and, and generally, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take them doing what they actually feel good for yeah. them to do, especially, yeah. I mean, you know, when, when yeah. they're in this situation, because otherwise uh, they will be like, okay, you told me to do this. I do this. You know, I'm like, you know, when I teach, I, I normally don't tell people to do something. You know, I ask them to inquire to the possibility to do certain things. You know, because uh, my idea of uh, you know that I have maybe you know, how you're supposed to do things or is doesn't fit your body, right? Uh, you have to feel how you are when you are in in the pose when you do some movement. You know. You know, I can only guess certain things, but uh, in the end of the day, uh, I want to, I say, empower them on taking a decision. You know, mm. especially when when it comes comes down to to pain, to feeling pain, or having some trouble with the body, or in general, you know, other things that happen in life. Because uh, you know, 
when you teach people or like have students who have been coming for 10, 15 years in my Miser class, can you understand? It's like five days a week for 15 years. It's not two months a year, you know, and you know, you don't see them anymore. I think that is a lot of know, time so together, they, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And so, and also the relationship that, you know, that you build with students, um, it's very different than somebody who's coming, you know, randomly once a year or twice a year, you know, for, for a couple of months, you see a couple of hours in the morning. So, you know, you start to get to know the people much deeper. I know you, the job they're doing, I know they're maybe somebody passed away in the family or something, or they're having struggled with the job, they got divorced. And so according with that, I also have to support them, you know, with, through the practice eventually uh, in certain way. So the practice is going to maybe even change. Sometimes maybe I see they are struggling with something, you know, I just invite them to do a slower practice, a shorter practice maybe, or more meditation towards the end or something like, you know, focusing more and just try to relax, in, you know, in, in the ending, finishing pose. The, you know, I, I try to, in general, I try to support the students, you know, uh, mm, because I want, mm, mm, mm. you know, my, I think my my main goal as a yoga teacher, uh, if I can call myself a yoga teacher, I don't know, but uh, it's to help people to, to have a better life. I'm, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to say that I, I can help people to get enlightened or like awakening, you know, the Kundalini. Uh, this might happen or, or, or might not through the practice or through any other things. Uh, what I, again, what is my main goal is, is really supporting people and, and, and giving, you know, a place where, you know, they can come, they can practice. And, and they can be with themselves, mm. you know, and they can, mm. you know, so I, I, I'm supporting I mean, them. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and, that, uh, that's what I'm trying to do. In that vein, do you find it, do you find there are any challenges coming to an Eastern culture with a Western mentality um, in terms of how to relate? I mean, I'm assuming you have, uh, you know, some of your students have become friends out of class and, you know, and I'm assuming it's probably not easy to to relate directly and 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 not be on a pedestal yeah. be put be put on a pedestal um you know i mean you've lived in japan for a long time now i mean you know yeah. how do you suit your mentality to the japanese mentality and you know are there any obvious differences that you come up, up against a lot yes you you learn when you're here you learn you know you, you make some mistakes of course you know and then and there's this, you know, doesn't doesn't matter how long you stay in, in, in a different country. You see that, you know, you are Italian, you are English, you you know, there is certain things, you know, that you know, some conditioning of culture uh, that there are still going to be there. But again, I, I I soften up to certain things. You know, I I I learn how to speak. For example, I learn how to ask things, because again, if you ask things directly, most of the time you won't get an answer. Why is that? Um, because this is, this is the way that most people, you know, interact, you know, there's no, and a direct answer question, uh, uh, it's can be, sometimes can be defined as a rule. But right. if you mm -hmm. go, on, if you know, if you know how to go around, you know, it's like, you know, when, when you read some emails, for example, you know, it's like the first thing is not like, hey, how are you? Can I do this? The first thing is like, oh, it's hot today. The weather is like this. I hope you are not having, you know, trouble with the heat or something. You know, there's an introduction. Yeah. It's not like bang. You know? yeah. And then there is eventually there's a question formulated nicely. Um, so that's that's what happened. You know, also in the meetings, you know, job meetings or whatever. It's like you you start to learn. You you learn. You know, whatever you are in a different culture. In the beginning, you come with you know with your truth and your being. Uh, but then suddenly you, you see it's not working. So like either you keep fighting against the wall, or intelligently you start to adapt. You start to learn. You start to you know integrate yourself you know mm. in, in the culture and yeah. um, i mean you've been there a long time would you consider that you're going to stay there i mean how how do you, does your future look i mean 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Yeah. Because uh, You'll be shocked when you come back to Italy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I back, spend there yeah. a, a couple, two or three months a year. I, I'm in Italy, actually. So, you know, um, I still keep... I, I always did, actually. All the years I've been here, I always came back and, and tried to keep connection with my family, with my friends and my culture. Yeah. I think it's very mm. important, too. Um, mm. so, but yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm open. Life is being so, it is so unpredictable. I, I never thought I would come to Japan. And when I came to Japan, I never thought I would stay so long. You know, I, I was in Berlin, I was in Copenhagen, you know, I live in different countries and, and, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's next, really. You know, I was going to say. I mean, I just yeah, wrapping it up now. And, and you know, what what, yeah. what do you see in your future? What where where would you like to be in your future? And you've got any challenges that you want to you know any plans? Any uh, any any anything no, you want to you know, I, work on? I I definitely think that you know as as I grow older, at one point I would like to move back to Europe. I have this this sometimes this feeling of like you know that I would like to spend the rest. You know, my, my latest days when I'm old, I like to spend it maybe in, in Italy, in my country. Um, that's, I don't know, it's maybe romantic, I'm not sure, <laughs> or some something, but it's like feeling like, you know, closing uh, the circle, you know. Um, but again, I could, you know, that's, that's so, it's just an, an hypothesis, you know, because in the end of the day, I, I I could probably pass away tomorrow, you know, who knows, you know, I mean, I saw all different kinds of things happening, you know, in my life that, you know, hardly can tell anything. So I'm open, there's possibilities, you know, I'm always listening, I'm always aware about my surrender and I'm, you know, if there's a, you know, possibility uh, to move back, maybe at one point I will. Uh, not mm. necessary now, now because I, I, you know, I spent here for so many years and have such a nice group of students. You know that that you know there's a, there's a good relation and and it's not friends relation. It's friendly, but it's not friend relation. So I always right. make sure that there is no. They are not, we're not just going to drink a coffee every day together. You know, say after the practice, and not not because I. I think is bad. It's just like I think it's very important to uh, to have this this space. Right. You know what I mean? Like you know, uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's I great. It's I mean, it's funny you brought up a lot of topics that I that I think and and talk about a lot, and the the friend teacher relationship being one of them. Um, and many people would say like, well, I I like to be friends with my students, and uh, I've always felt like you know that there but should be you a can be bit friendly there's, there's you can people. be friendly yeah of course <laughs> I mean, there's two different things going on isn't there you know but but friendships yeah. are a different thing i think and, and they uh, you know for me they've always gotten the way of a teaching relationship i mean i know that you have your your biker friends um so i assume you're kept busy with with uh friendship groups with your with your motorbike trips and uh, and then you you know your yeah. your teaching relationships can be kept separate to that which you know in my mind it makes sense um Okay, just to wrap it up, Granty, uh, I know you've got some good uh, answers for these two questions. Um, I always do this in the podcast. Do you give me an inspiration, something you're inspired by, uh, and a guilty pleasure. Um, I say guilty pleasure, but it's a joke, really. You know, like something you take pleasure in, and an uh, inspiration can be a person, place, or a book, or anything. You know, just uh, two questions I always ask at the end. My inspiration, I would say. Richard Freeman. Oh, really? Oh, that's that's a that's a first, oh, right? Right. Yeah, Richard Freeman has been amazing for me. I mean, I think I had, I had several moments with him. You know, and uh, I invited him to Japan. He came here to teach. I was there teacher training. I went to you know wherever it was possible to take his workshop mm. and stuff. And has been such an inspiring teacher for me. And and. In his presence, and you know, when he was talking, uh, I had moments of, like, if you want to call small awakening, or like, you know, this this so called ah, mm. you know what I mean? It's like, oh, like if there was some kind of opening inside me somehow, you know, uh, which is, you know, uh, quite remarkable. 
to me. Mm, mm. And so, uh, yeah, for me, richer is. That's a good one. Much yeah, many people, I'm sure, think about yes. that. But uh, yeah, the first person that's actually said it. What about a pleasure? I mean, you're probably going to mention your motorbikes, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like I live in, in a city where there are 30 million people, you know, it's like it's like it's building after building. It's like, and so in the weekend, whenever I have a free time, I, I take my motorbike and I explore a mountain, you know, I go to the ocean rivers, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and that this kind of like just me and my motorbike and the, you know, the roads and then, you know, that feeling of like, it, it's unbelievable. So, so for me, it's, it's one of the most, uh pleasurable thing and uh, i think the second one especially the last few years has been um enjoying time with my mom uh you know like uh, really taking some short vacation with her you know see her smile see her like lighting up you know seeing her you know amazed from certain places she's never been before it's like this is pure pleasure for me. It's pure pleasure because, you know, I think I put always my parents in front of anything else. You know, it's like to me, you know, they give us life and they, you know, they struggle and they raise me and uh, they taught me many things. And uh, I, I can't believe what I'm saying, but honestly, it's like, it's very pleasurable for me to spend time with my mom and to, to share moments of life, you know. Oh, yeah. That's nice. Where does she like best? Where have you taken her that she she's uh, she was most uh, oh, excited about? Oh, we, we go to the we go to the lake. We go to the ocean. I take her sometimes okay. some places. You know, like uh, and she's just amazed. I can see how much she enjoy. You know, and and for me, that's really really a pleasure to see her happy. Well. Kanti, it's been equally a pleasure for me to uh, to chat to you again today after so many years. So, uh, you know, thanks for taking the time. And uh, I hope we manage to meet in person somewhere. Yeah. Thank again, you so much. Some, uh, I'm future. sorry for my English, but... Uh, that was yeah. perfect. I mean, I was often... Over this time of the hour, I've often thought, my God, he's speaking all this in English, like, so perfectly and well, you know, like... And just envisaging my trying to communicate myself in Italian, like. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, and uh, it's been such a such a nice uh, treat to meet you again, uh, even thank over you. the airwaves. Thanks. Ciao.